Hello, and welcome to the second lesson of our module about Tocharian syntax. In this video, we'll continue to uh, our overview uh, on syntactic features of Tocharian. First, we'll look at their positions, and then we'll look at specific syntactic features of the verbal system. So again, this part of the course requires some basic knowledge about the uh, morphological categories of Tocharian, and these are found in uh, another lesson. So we'll start by looking at uh, at positional structure. Um, at positional phrases are less common than case constructions. Several at positions uh, are frozen case forms, and at positions may be used to emphasize. Uh, for instance, a location which is already expressed by a case. So they are sometimes redundant uh, in the syntax. So we see here uh, an example uh, from a literary example, which is uh, uh, very nice. So we see here the um, we have here just as the king of the ruddy goose, and then there is this phrase, great water, great water, over a great water, over, you see. So he's moving over the water in the perlative, but in order to emphasize that he's really not on the water, he's like flying maybe a meter or half a meter over the water. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's about a bird flying here. They add eshek. And then from leaf to leaf with the allative moving. Uh, now, if we look at linearization, postpositions are more frequent. However, prepositions do occur as well. And some of the adpositions can have uh, both positions, which means that they can be both pre posing as well as post posing. And at position generally select for case, but they may select for different cases. For instance, uh, they may be used for with both the uh, oblique uh, and with the allative uh, and with the locative, such as uh, we see here, emske. Now we'll move over to the verb. So uh, we'll talk about predication and uh, specifically about the usages or the syntax of the verb. We'll start with alignment. And uh, Tocharian alignment is strictly nominative accusative. And there are a few, or I would say no, ergative tendencies. The interesting issue here is rather how the case system is used to mark uh, core and peripheral cases, uh, which I talked about in a previous lesson. Uh, and uh, the distinction between primary and secondary cases reflect the difference between the core and the periphery. And uh, an important issue is uh, the lack of the dative. And the dative, the Indopian dative, has been merged uh, into Carian with the genitive. So historically, the genitive endings, which are basically inflectional, but which also show traces of agglutinating technique, which means that the genitive was probably also a secondary case at a certain specific time. However, they represent both the Indopian dative as well as the genitive. And in Tocharian, as I said in the previous lesson, the genitive has both functions. Uh, it's uh, possessive in noun phrases as well as the indirect object in di uh, ditransitive constructions. So here we have an example. As you see, the monks teach the monks are here, they are the subject, and they teach the law, and that's the direct object, to the nuns, which is the indirect object, and you see here, it's in genitive. Um, another important feature in the alignment is the use of the clitic pronouns. The Clitic pronouns can take all core functions if, except for the subject or agent function, which means that they cannot replace a nominative. So, um, 
basically, if we look at the clitics here, we see that they can be the direct object of transitive verbs. They can be the indirect object with ditransitive verbs. They can also uh, function as the non-canonical A in, in non-canonical case uh, constructions. Uh, they can mark the A uh, or the agent, and uh, they can be used for possessor as well as agent in passive constructions. And except, uh, except for number one, which means the direct object of transitive verbs, all the other functions are represented in, uh, in non-clitic constructions by the genitive. Now uh, we'll look basically at the canonical case marking. So the A, the agent, is marked by a nominative, the direct object is marked by uh, the oblique or by a clitic, uh, and the indirect object is marked by a genitive or by a clitic. So uh, in constructions um, we may have both, like a genitive as well as a clitic. And we have an example here, as from the Shadanta Jatakya. I have sent you the tasks. So you see here that the indirect object here is marked by a clitic. And uh, there is also an alternative way of uh, marking ditransitivity, and you have a double oblique construction here. You see, so you have the direct object in oblique and the indirect object in uh, oblique. And here, we have an example from the Aranamijataka, and it says who indeed announces with the optative um, to the great king uh, our arrival. So this is this here is the direct object, and here we have the indirect object with the verb meaning to announce something to someone, and we have two. Um, two obliques instead of a genitive and an oblique that would be the normal case. So, non-canonical case marking. Non-canonical case marking is rare in Tocharian. It's however found with a handful of verbs such as uh, Tocharian be ken, to cam, come to pass of a wish, or Tocharian be tsenk, to rise, Tocharian be menk, to be deprived of, to suffer, to lack, to carry and be clean, to be necessary, to carry and be tem, to be born, to come to existence, uh, to carry an a ken, uh, to be fulfilled or fulfill, to carry an a nuk, to extinct, to, dis to be extinct, to disappear, or to carry an a pukt, which means to be realized, or to carry an a katk, to arise. So, here is an example. Therefore, it says, umte. It's necessary, and you see here, it's the third singular. So in a non-canonical case uh, construction, we have the impersonal constructions, because some languages use, in, in some languages, the verb agrees with the non-canonical uh, case, but here it doesn't. So we have an impersonal construction, and uh, so it is necessary for you. In genitive. Another interesting thing is in, in Tocharian is how the null arguments are expressed. So zero arguments or so-called zero transitive verbs are normally so-called weather verbs, like it's raining, it's snowing, it's thundering, and some languages require uh, a first argument or like an agent or a, a subject, sorry, a subject in these constructions. So no one looked at this in uh, Tocharian, so I made a little overview and I found uh, no examples of an empty slot uh, with a null argument. However, um, the issue needs to be further investigated with more examples. But I have um, an example here where it's from the Navadana, and you see here, um, at this time, oblique singular, rain 
rained. So uh, I looked up all instances of the verb rain and it's very often used with flowers raining. It's this specific Buddhist thing that flowers rained. But how here I found a real a proper example of rain raining and you see that they put Swesse rain rain rained so uh, it's likely that they don't allow uh, no argument here but uh, we don't know for sure so um, if we move over to um, structural processes uh, to the possessive in so even if non-canonical case marking is rare, Tokarian is clearly a there is to me language rather than an I have language. This is a very important distinction between languages of the world, whether they have a verb for have, to have something like, like we have in English. Uh, but Tokarian doesn't have a verb to have, so they say there is to me, and they use uh, Tokarian a, a nas, Tokarian b nest, it's the verb to be, or they use the ab uh, verb mesk, to be, to exist, or Tokarian b tem, to be born, to come into existence, to come up with, with a genitive and with a clitic. And here is an example. Uh, so, um, it says, you see here, b forgiveness may be for me instead of may I have uh, forgiveness. So uh, this is an example of these constructions, but there are plenty of other examples of this construction in Tokarian. Now we'll move over to um, voice and uh, valency change. And specifically, we'll start with the passive. And as you have seen in the morphology uh, lesson, Tokarian has a set of endings that mark middle passive. And these are used uh, to form a passive construction. So passive is marked by a middle passive ending and an agent which is in genitive, perlative or in the instrumental, but only in Tokarian A, because Tokarian B doesn't have an instrumental case. The genitive is mainly uh, used by infinitive verbs and uh, middle is used in passive constructions uh, with uh, in these constructions. So the perlative corresponds to uh, the genitive and in Tokarian A the animate agents have perlative and inanimate have the instrumental case. So we have a very nice, very nice example here from the Punyavanta Jataka again and uh, you see here and this it, it talks about uh, uh, your, um, it talks about uh, uh, about uh, good deeds or good behavior and uh, it says it cannot be burned by fire instrumental it cannot be overflown by water instrumental it cannot be carried away by kings perlative and it cannot be uh, stolen by thieves. So that's this example shows very clearly that the difference between animate and non-animate agents. So moving over to the proper middle functions, there are three types. Uh, the so-called media tantum in Tokarian grammar and it is verbs that are uh, found only in middle passive, so they cannot be active. Then we have the so-called medio actives, and it's verbs that are inflected as middle passive in the present, whereas they are active in the preterite. And in the subjunctive, they can be both. And then we have uh, active middle passive verbs that have the same type of matching all the way through the entire paradigm. If we look uh, now at uh, specifically at middle passive functions, we have first uh, the reflexive, you know, someone adorns oneself. We have the reciprocal, uh, it's krapter, they gather together. 
we have a non-reflexive or non-reciprocal, they collected the bones. And then we have many other uh, functions uh, which are s have parallels in other uh, languages, also in European. So we have body actions, we have emotions, speech actions, spontaneous events, um, disruption, motion, position, and physical ch uh, chemical change, uh, and so forth. So, an interesting thing uh, about middle passive functions is that they also can be used to mark anti-causative, which means that they may be used to decrease the valency of the verb. And a good example is the verb akl into Karian A. And the interesting thing that it's it has this specific function into Karian A, but not into Karian B. But into Karian A, the active verb, the active form means to teach whereas the middle passive form means to learn. And there are also other examples like uh, the verb be on, a on in active means meet, whereas in middle passive it means to begin. So, as we've seen before, the middle can also be used to mark a passive, uh, in a passive construction. Now, We'll move over to one of the most interesting parts of Tickerian verbal syntax, which is the extremely complex system of non-causative and causative verb stems. As we have seen in the morphology section, there are uh, various combinations of stem classes of the verbs uh, in present, subjunctive and preterite, which can be combined according to a specific schedule. So, you see here, we have 12 present classes, we have also 12 subjunctive classes, and we have 6 preterite classes. So, this is part of the morphology, like you have seen before. So, uh, these classes, both the presents, the subjunctives, and the preterites, they have an in inherent transitivity. And there are typically two ways in which verbs increase or decrease their uh, transitivity. So either they add another set of stems, like uh, the present, the subjunctive, or the preterite, or they use the middle passive, as we have seen before. And this creates a unique and very complex setup of uh, different transitivity forms which in turn has consequences for the coding of the alignment. And it's very specific uh, to, uh, to to Karian. It's also very complex. The combination of a present, a subjunctive, and a preterite stim, as you see here, um, follow a certain pattern. So for one individual verb. There is there can be one, two, or sometimes even three or four combinations of stem classes in present subjunctive or preterite on the verb. And uh, this specific system of Tocharian is in the literature referred to as Grundverb or Grundverb and causative, that's the, uh, in the German Tocharology tradition. So I prefer to call them non-causative and causative. And almost each and every verb of Tocharian has this uh, distinction, this setup of stem uh, classes or combinations of stem classes. And um, this gives us also an, an idea about the purpose of this grammatical pattern. It serves an, as, as an instrument to change the valency of the verb. And very common is, for instance, a combination of a present three as intransitive, and a present eight as transitive. And then, accordingly, there are subjunctives and preterites to the intransitive and transitive uh, stem combinations. So, let's look at some examples. Uh, it's very interesting to consider how these various forms come out. Uh, the transitivity increase is sometimes, but normally not straightforward. 
So the meaning change could be increase uh, of uh, active uh, involvement uh, of the agent rather than increase in transitivity. So it's all very complex. We look here, for instance, at the, uh, this list of causatives. We see that the intransitive variant means to stay away. The transitive is uh, to reject and to refuse, uh, to be separated, to separate, to be free, to free from, be connected, to join, be filled, feel, be capable, bring about, take courage, console, disappear, destroy, be spread, spread, rejoice, gladden, be deluded, and bewitch. Okay, so even more interesting is a specific group of verbs that take three sets of stems. And uh, this uh, can be compared to the so-called double causatives, which is found in, uh, for instance, Turkic languages. And here, the increase in transitivity or activity is even more blurred than in the normal uh, verbal stems with two, uh, with two sets of forms. So, for instance, we have to carry and be spurk, which means disappear, avoid, and drive away. away. Uh, be trick, be confused, be confused, or mistake, and then to be confused, there's no real change. Wick, to disappear, and uh, pass away, and put to flight or dissolve. And be lank to hang, intransitive, hang, transitive, and to let hang or dangle. And be turk to burn, to torment and torture, torture. So you can see that there is really an, an increase in the degree of involvement by the agent here. To uh, uh, be wack to split, and the transitive to separate, and then to separate. So sometimes there is no real difference, sometimes you can see that there is a difference. Now uh, we move over to aspect. Um, aspect dimensions are coded in past tense, basically in Tokarian, and uh, imperfective aspect is marked by an imperfect, and the perfective is marked by the preterite. So we have a, a nice example here. Uh, the Buddha uh, uh, stayed, and you see here, you have the imperfect. So he was sitting on the bank of the river, and again, perlatives, he was sitting on the bank of the river of Palgumati, and what he did here, he was sitting there, and it was probably something that he did uh, repeatedly or normally as he used to do, so it's imperfect. And uh, in a forested place, so you see here, he was by the by the river perlative, but he was in a forested place. And he taught preterite to the monks, genitive plural, uh, about impurity or decay of the body. So this is from the Vinaya Vibhanga, a very nice example. Um, uh, progressive is marked by present, uh, but retrospective is marked either by the preterite or by an auxiliary construction with a ness and b ness. So we have another example here um, where we have this uh, construction, and it's from the Maitreya Samhita Nataka. So in, in the Maitreya Samhita Nataka, locative, and um, uh, uh, in the eleventh act, and then ceased. So this eleventh act by the name of Guru Darshana, but it has come to an end. So you see, here you have the preterite um, as in the retrospective aspect. So um, the aspectual differences are reflected, as I said, by the usages of the imperfect and the preterite in texts. So, events that are seen as more important uh, to the story can be marked by a, a preterite, whereas less important events are marked by an imperfect. Embedded stories, such as uh, indir uh, indirect speech, are marked by imperfect, 
whereas other events in past tense are normally marked by the preterite. Repeated actions or events are normally marked by imperfect, but if they are seen as individual and momentary, which means that they are taking place one after another, the preterite is used. Uh, the preterite is the normal form for narrative texts, but is often interrupted by absolutives and sometimes by a historical present. And preterite is also the usual form of verbs in economic and administrative documents when they refer to events in the past tense, as well as in remarks and in colophons. Now we move over, uh, move over to tense. And there are three tenses, present, past and future. Present is marked by the present tense, uh, either in active or in middle passive. Past is marked by imperfect, in imperfective aspect, by the preterite in perfective aspect, or occasionally by a historical present. Periphrastic constructions by uh, the verb a nas, b nes, and forms of the preterite participle or the gerundive occur as well to express, for instance, uh, retrospective, as we have seen before. And uh, future uh, is marked by present subjunctive or a periphrastic future by a gerund to and the present of the copula. So um, here we have uh, from the Maitreya Samiti Nataka. Um, we are born in hell, which is a typical example of the retrospective. So now we'll look again uh, at the same text that, that we had before, uh, the Punyavanta Jataka and the story about the mechanical doll. And uh, now we'll look instead at the forms of the in past tense, uh, the forms uh, in uh, imperfect and in the preterite tense. So uh, we have here, just like that at another time, this painter went. And you see here, we have an imperfect. So it means that it's an imperfective aspect. So, so he went to, to the house of the mechanic as a guest. And thereupon the mechanic, you know, in all ways to the painter uh, having done, this is uh, a verbal noun in the ablative and that's uh, translating uh, basically a, um, a Sanskrit absolutive honor for the night and then separately in the house here preterite he covered so what's happening here there is first imperfective aspect and now there is perfective aspect because he makes a bed for him it's just uh, something that happens once and uh, then he did he puts again he makes it down, it's a causative. He puts this mechanical uh, girl here at the head, but you see here, it's again a preterite, like here. So it's, it's an occasional event. And then with, uh, with reverence, all this kind, beauty and honor, uh, doing, and seizing by the hand, she did. And you see here, again, we have the imperfect. So it means that uh, she, it's as if she was doing this repeatedly. So remember here in the text, we have the ID that this mechanical doll is supposed to be a servant or someone who is serving the painter. And this is something that she's not doing at this specific uh, occasion. That's the habit of her because she's a servant. So as if she was doing service to him. And then we have this imperfect. 
So, um, thank you for watching this video. And in the next and last one of the whole series about the carry-on, we will look at clause and sentence syntax.